They found five weapons and 700 rounds of ammunition. We found disguises, mustaches, forehead Halloween masks. That's when I said, I know who this guy is. If there was any type of action made toward him, he would physically retaliate. With all the yelling and the screaming, and it was very frightening, I remember thinking, I can't move. I can't move. You just want to get to him in any way you can because you want to stop him. But he's, he's like a ghost. Historic Radnor Township, Pennsylvania, once a country retreat for Philadelphia's most prominent families, is nestled just 15 miles west of the city. But in the spring of 2001, a simple discovery turns this prosperous community upside down as authorities find themselves hot on the trail of one of the most elusive and relentless criminals in FBI history. In the woods behind the Radnor Police Department, 13-year-olds Boyd Small and Ken Davidoff are looking for materials to build a fort when they stumble upon a large plastic pipe buried in the ground. Inside, they found smaller PVC tubes. And they were about three foot in length and probably about six inches in diameter. They opened it up and they saw some documents in there that they thought were quite alarming. And they didn't know what they have. It was way beyond their comprehension of what it could be used for. And they walked it over to the police station. And a patrol officer escorted the boys back to the location where they discovered the items. In the ground, hidden under a large piece of plywood and some debris, is a military-style bunker. The bunker was back in here. This has been redeveloped now, so it's not like it used to be eight years ago. But at the time, we were able to walk back through here with all the brush that was down, and the bunkers were kind of put into the hill in the old trolley tracks. The perfectly camouflaged hole is about three feet across and four feet deep. It was lined with brick and cinder block, so whoever had put it together at that time was very precise and digging it out. And we really took our time looking through everything, making sure nobody was going to get hurt. The sergeant that was working that day had been in the military, so he was aware of booby traps and, and things of that nature. Once cleared, investigators proceed to unearth what appears to be a paramilitary stockpile. They found five weapons and 700 rounds of ammunition, along with medical equipment, some MREs, some magazines, and some additional documents. It's very unusual to recover something of that nature in this area especially, so we really didn't know what we had at the time. Then, investigators discover something even more alarming. The handguns had the serial numbers of Red Reed. They were ground off. This was not just scraped off. This was taking a grinding machine and grinding the serial number off. When we saw the weapons, which had their serial numbers obliterated, we started to become concerned. Authorities are now certain that they're dealing with experienced criminals, and their concern turns to confusion when alongside the arsenal, they uncover several Halloween masks. Whoever was involved in this, obviously, was trying to protect their identity, if it was one person or, or many people in this. Local authorities quickly realize that they may be ill-equipped to deal with the potential danger and call in the county, state, and federal authorities to assist. FBI agents from the Philadelphia Division are some of the first to swing into action. I called our bomb guy and our evidence team, and I had a bomb doll come up just to do a cursory search to look for more ammunition, more explosives. We spent the whole day there, and then we took everything into custody. We still didn't know what we had. As a next step, 
FBI agents begin pouring through the mountain of evidence looking for clues. There was a stack of paper, probably three or four inches thick, that basically they were maps that had coded names to them, coded directions to them. Then there were lists of what were stored in various sites, and there, there must have been like maybe 10 different locations. In an incredible stroke of luck, an agent recognizes the layout on one of the maps to be from a location about 80 miles away in Carbon County, Pennsylvania, where he rides his bike. Conservation officer Fred Merluzzi knows the territory like the back of his hand. I knew what it was right away. I recognized the shape of it as the shape of my parking lot on my game lands. A team of investigators is dispatched to the area to pick up the trail. But cracking the map maker's code proves challenging and the rugged terrain extremely difficult to negotiate. And I hiked that mountain and hiked that mountain. I wore out socks hiking that mountain, and I would always come to a dead end. But after more than three grueling months of searching, investigators finally hit pay dirt when they track map coordinates to a suspicious looking pile of rocks less than two miles from the Game Commission parking lot. We pulled one rock out to verify it, and there was the corner of a 20 millimeter ammo can staring back at us. So we knew we had the site. That was like finding lost gold to me. Once again, investigators uncover a treasure trove of weapons, but it's far worse than anything they were anticipating. There were rifles. You had AR-15s, an Uzi mini 14 rifle they were stored in uh, pvc pipes with caps on the end in total the team unearths 44 firearms and more proof that this new discovery is connected to the one in radnor the shoulder weapons had the serial numbers ground off just as they did in radnor township we found probably 5,000 rounds of 223 ammunition we found disguises, mustaches, full head uh, Halloween masks. Well, we're wondering, why would a person go to all that trouble to store these items up in the mountains? Investigators don't know exactly what they found, but they do know that they need to act fast. Inside the bunkers, there's enough firepower for an army of extremists to take on any small town police department and wipe out hundreds of innocent civilians. Who buries weapons in the ground? Unless it's for a reason. And you're thinking, what in this area, what would be a target? After unearthing several bunkers filled with firearms and Halloween masks, investigators in Pennsylvania suspect there may be an extremist group in their midst. That was the thought process when they first found the bunker, the local authorities, was the fact that they were dealing with some terrorist group, some supremacist group. The question now is, what sort of attack are they planning? My initial impression was whoever did this was somebody who was in the preparation stage who was gathering data and hadn't acted yet. With the clock ticking, investigators pour through a cache of recovered documents. It was about 600 documents, and these documents included topographical maps. There was a list of banks, 180 banks, with surveillance of these banks. It's clear that whoever stocked the bunker has been keeping very close tabs on numerous banking institutions from Connecticut to Virginia. There were times the banks were open, the hours, dictating who came into the bank first, who left the bank, who the last one was out of the bank. Investigators' first concern is that financial institutions along the entire East Coast could be facing imminent attack from any number of underground militias or terrorist cells. 
But on closer inspection, another theory begins to surface. You could tell based upon the documents, the writing was all very, very similar. It seemed as though it was uh, someone's personal records that were actually buried in there. And as the pieces of the puzzle come together, it dawns on agents that they may be dealing with something far more ordinary than a terrorist plot. A criminal who is obliterating serial numbers on weapons, who is hiding disguises, uh, hats, masks, bags, in that information, there was also newspaper articles about bank robberies. All of those things led us to believe that was a bank robber who had those things stored there. There was no question that whoever was responsible for the bunker was a bank robber. The question was, who was it? And what banks did he rob? As investigators dig deeper, they quickly learn that several of the banks on the list have already been hit. That's when I said, I know who this guy is. And a couple of the guys in there said, who? And I said, this is the Friday night bank robber that we've been looking for since 1988. This is the type of organized individual that we've been looking for. Cunning, professional, and prolific. The Friday Night Bank Robber is one of the most notorious characters in the FBI's file of unsolved crimes. We're talking about an individual who robbed more banks than John Dillinger and Pretty Boy Floyd, perhaps, combined. It all started on a Friday in December of 1988, when a surprise visitor entered the Union National Bank in Latham, New York, just before closing time. It was game on as soon as he went in. You knew you were being robbed and he was in charge. He was pointing guns at people. He vaulted the counter, ordered the tellers to open the drawers, and he took the money from the counter. In less than two minutes, he's gone with several thousand dollars. And given the speed of the assault and the mask, no one can even describe what he looked like. Everybody says, well, what I saw was a gun barrel. And basically, that's what they saw. They saw that there was a disguise, but really could not tell us exactly what the disguise was. A couple of people were able to see the back of his neck where they could tell he was white and maybe had black hair. But other than that, he was, he was very well concealed. Eyewitness accounts provide limited clues other than the suspect is a slim male between 5'4 and 5'8, but there's absolutely nothing else to go on. At no time did anyone outside the bank see him entering before he was inside, and once he got out of the bank, he was gone. There were no witnesses. There was no evidence left behind. His MO suggests that they're dealing with a highly intelligent, well-trained adversary. And it was evident once he got inside the bank, he went right to where he needed to go in order to obtain what he wanted to obtain. The physicality that he demonstrated was remarkable. Leaping from a standstill while he was in front of the counter. Nobody move. You're next. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew exactly who he had to control. With no solid leads, investigators' only hope of catching him is to nab him in the act. And the odds are on their side. Most bank robbers who get away with it the first time will likely strike again. But as the months turn into years, there's no further sign of the Friday night bank robber, and the team gets caught up in other cases. Then, on February 22, 1991, an alarm goes off at the Jim Thorpe National Bank near Lee Heighton, Pennsylvania. He burst through the outer door. As soon as he hit the outer door, the tellers inside saw him. They set the alarm off. He continued on in through the second door of the bank. To his right, and the bank manager's desk was there. And when he saw the masked gunman come in, he just instinctively leaned forward. And I think the, the robber took that as a, a threat. 
The Friday night bank robber did not hesitate. He shot and hit the bank manager right center of mass above his navel and very, very severely wounded the bank manager. We felt that this guy must have like ice water in his veins because after he shot the manager, it didn't phase him at all. He just continued about with his business. He was on a mission and he carried that mission out. He displayed that if there was any type of action made toward him, that he would physically retaliate. The robber collects $8,900, and like before, he's gone without a trace. He left no evidence outside. He left no evidence inside. There were no cars uh, abandoned in the area. The bank manager, 34-year-old Zach Storch, is taken to the nearest emergency room. After a tense few hours, he manages to pull through. But authorities worry that the next victim may not be so lucky. He would confront others. He would not stop still for being confronted himself. And it made us in law enforcement realize his potential for violence. For years, the Friday night bank robber continues to hit banks along the East Coast and makes no attempt to hide his violent tendencies. He physically assaulted some of the mail tellers, pistol whip one. He was very vulgar and violent in his tone, which was enough to subdue the female tellers. One of his victims, Don Bressler, remembers what it feels like to be on the receiving end of the Friday night bank robber's anger. I remember thinking, I can't move. I can't move. And I just stood there as he was, you know, shouting, get up, get up. And at that point, you know, reality or whatever kind of struck, and I hit my alarm under my desk, and that's when he jumped over the teller counters. Somebody puts a gun in your face, and just that, that fear, you know, really, that, that he brought with him that night, he left with all of us. You never can tell what an individual will do when they come in, armed with a gun or if you believe they're armed with a gun. From a victim's perspective, uh, it can be life-altering. But after more than a decade, with an army of law enforcement officers dedicated to his capture, the Friday night bank robber remains untouchable. He comes and he goes and you never see him. And you don't know what you're looking for. You don't know where to look. And it becomes, from our perspective, very, very frustrating. You just want to get to him in any way you can because you want to stop him. But he's, he's like a ghost. The FBI has 150 evidence response teams, or ERTs, distributed across its field offices nationwide. They use cutting edge equipment like latent print fuming chambers and high magnification fiber optic imagers to assist them in investigations. In May 2001, after the discovery of two hidden bunkers full of firearms, military gear, and cryptic documents, the FBI thinks that they may finally be on the trail of the notorious Friday night bank robber who's eluded them for over a decade. It was the most disciplined adversary that the police or the FBI had because of his professionalism as a criminal. But what's one man doing with enough firepower to arm a militia? Why would a person go to all that trouble to store these items? up in the mountains. And what purpose is it serving? We discussed various things, uh, but we couldn't really come up with an idea or a reason why anyone would do that. We knew that we had somebody who was most unusual doing this, and I never had any doubt that it was our Friday night bank robber. He's not your typical bank robber. Your typical bank robber that you're used to seeing is someone that's local, someone that's usually involved in drugs, someone that works with many other people. This individual is working alone. This individual planned his offenses. Every bank was located near a wooded area so that he used that wooded area to be able to effectuate or be able to get away. After the near fatal shooting of a bank manager in 1991, authorities step up their efforts to catch him in the act. 
but he proves to be as cagey as he is methodical. We started conducting uh, stakeouts every Friday night along the whole eastern Pennsylvania and into New York. The likely banks were ones that fit the description of the banks he had previously robbed and also some of the banks that he had robbed in the past because there were several banks that he had robbed twice. We were never successful in being at the same bank at the same time. How he manages to continually elude detection has the FBI and local law enforcement baffled. At times, it seems as if he could actually be toying with them, purposely luring authorities into a strange game of cat and mouse. On at least one occasion, we had a surveillance team on a bank during a night that it was not robbed. Following Friday night, that bank was robbed. On one uncharacteristic springtime attack, the robber strikes in the middle of the day, just as the vault's been opened for an armored car delivery. And he removed all the money from the safe and then fled out through the front doors. He got in excess of $120,000 at the time of the robbery, which is well more than any other robbery that we had investigated to date in that area. Roadblocks go up, and a full-scale manhunt ensues. We went through the wood lines trying to find physical evidence. We went door to door talking to uh, citizens to see if anybody had seen anything at the time of the robbery. But once again, the Friday night bank robber seems to have vanished into thin air. Well, it's quite frustrating. You want to resolve the issues. You want to work and try and come up with a game plan that we could successfully find the individual who's responsible, but it, it's, it's, it's frustrating. You have nothing to work with. After an estimated 27 robberies, the investigative team reaches out to Special Agent Ray Carr in the fall of 2000. Well, they called me and said, there's a guy that's been robbing banks since like 1988, and we have no idea who this guy is. Through 12 years of reports, surveillance video, and eyewitness accounts, Agent Carr and his colleagues are able to generate the most complete suspect profile to date. In putting all this information together and reading, I have a real good feel of what type of individual that we're looking for. It was a white male. We figured it was anywhere between 5'4 and 5'8. He stayed to himself. He most likely had military training. He was most likely into exercising, some type of uh, physical activity, such as martial arts. He had a very good working knowledge of weapons. He had a very good working knowledge of the areas that he was in. He was very formidable in what he did. He made things difficult for law enforcement for, for many, many, many years because of his propensity to plan and because of his intelligence. He was smart. But after the discovery of the military-style bunkers in Pennsylvania, investigators have a whole new set of questions. Why the huge cache of weapons? Could the Friday night bank robber be planning something even bigger? The concern now was, was someone going to get hurt again? We were trying to prevent that from happening. As the next step, Agents send evidence from the bunkers to the FBI lab at Quantico, while a task force sifts through the plethora of remaining documents looking for anything that could shed light on their suspect's identity. We had a, a large meeting and leads were distributed to all the different agencies and all the different entities that were at the meeting in order to help this thing move forward. And it's not long before several of the recovered items spark investigators' interest. Inside of that first bunker was a list of books. And all these books were statistics books. So I'm thinking either he really likes math or he, he works in that area. The list also references the Camp Hill Juvenile Detention Facility and a middle school in the town of Lower Marion, both in Pennsylvania. It's a definite starting point, but soon, they unearth an even more promising clue. One of the things they came across was karate videos. And underneath the karate videos, it had Dillman plaques. 
What is that? So a friend of mine decides to Google Dillman, and he comes up with Dillman Karate. But as investigators soon discover, Dillman Karate is a huge national chain with franchises in more than 100 cities. Nevertheless, in the spring of 2001, agents reach out to the head of the company, George Dillman. We told him the type of individual we're looking for. We said he's anywhere between 5'4 and 5'8. He's kind of stays to himself. He likes weapons, maybe prior military experience. He says, look, I have 430 dojos in this country. And he says, uh, that could be just about anybody. So it kind of left us kind of high and dry. Dillman offers what help he can, providing the FBI with detailed information on his chain of karate schools. I said, I'm going to send leads out to all these dojos throughout the country, see what we get. At least start in the areas where the banks have been robbed. But before we do that, there's three of these dojos that are affiliated with Dillman Karate right here in the Philadelphia area. Ray Carr was able to develop one that was five or 10 miles at the most from where the bunker was discovered in Radnor. We were going to go in there and say, uh, hey, is there a short guy in here who's uh, very into math, who doesn't talk too much about his personal life? But investigators don't have to look very far. When we went into the karate studio, the first guy we met was uh, rather short. So I said to him, I said, uh, uh, what do you do for a living? He says, uh, I'm a school teacher, high school teacher. OK, what do you teach? He said, chemistry. What high school does he teach at? I immediately became suspicious. He could be the Friday night robber. In the spring of 2001, Two months after investigators locate a bunker belonging to one of the most elusive and prolific bank robbers in American history, authorities question a Philadelphia area chemistry teacher named Tim Everidge. He was the same height, uh, you know, the interest in math. He's in the karate studio we're talking about, and that's just was the red flags for me. Investigators interview Everidge for an hour. But his candor and calm demeanor ultimately convinces Agent Carr that he's not the man they're looking for. When you do what myself and other agents have done for years and years, you can tell when someone's lying to you. Doesn't take, doesn't take much. You know right away when someone's lying. But just as they're about to move on to the next dojo, Everidge mentions a friend of his that seems to match some of the characteristics investigators have been describing. As a matter of fact, he's one of the top karate guys within the dojo. And I says, uh, what does he do for a living? He says, he's a self-employed statistician. I says, really? The man's name is Carl Gagajian. He indicated that Carl was one of his closest friends. I asked him, uh, do you know if Carl's married? And when the gentleman had to think about it, he said, gee, I don't know. I think everybody in the room realized that well, there might be more going on with him than we, than we originally thought. We go back to the barracks, and we run him up, Gugasian, and we come up with a criminal history. He's shot when he's uh, 15 years old in a buttocks, committing a burglary at a candy store in Haverford Township, and he spends a year in Camp Hill. Camp Hill Juvenile Detention Center the same center listed among items found in one of the bunkers. Gagasian's prints are immediately sent to the FBI lab for comparison against any prints technicians can find on the bunker materials. Meanwhile, investigators dig deeper into Gagasian's background and soon realize he fits their profile to a T. He graduates from Villanova and goes into the military He's during the Vietnam War, yet he doesn't get deployed. He leaves the military and winds up at University of Penn for his master's degree in electrical engineering. And then he goes on to Penn State and does post-grad work in statistics. So that led us to be pretty confident that this may be our guy. 
With all the background information in hand, it doesn't take long for an FBI clerk to track down a local address. She's in one room and I'm in another, and the next thing I hear is a scream, oh my God. She says he lives directly across the street in the apartment complex from where the first bunker was found. But authorities don't want to expose themselves just yet. Not until they have more evidence. So at that point, I said the next step is to go out to the apartment complex. First, they question the property manager about Gagasian and find that he's made quite an impression. They said, uh, he's CIA, right? I went, no. Then he's got to be in the witness protection program. I went, no. Why do you say that? He said, because he's weird. I says, why is he weird? I said, because he runs a lot. I said, well, I run too. I says, I don't see that. why well, that's weird. He says, yeah, but he runs fully clothed with a backpack. He was out getting into shape. He was out physically conditioning himself and doing so running in his regular street clothing. We also found out that he didn't have a job that he went to every day and that he presented himself as being an, an unemployed statistician. Suspicion only mounts when investigators learn that Gagasian moved out of his apartment just a few weeks after the Radner bunker was discovered. I'm sure that he either saw the FBI recovering the stuff that night or a little check he did when he walked through the area and he saw that his stuff was disturbed. And at that point, he knew he had a problem. After more than 12 years, the Bureau is now convinced they've identified the Friday night bank robber. But they still lack physical evidence linking him to the robberies themselves. I thought we had a strong case, but there's always uh, risk in litigation, especially when you have a circumstance where no one could point to him and say, I saw him, he's the one who robbed the bank. Gagasian is assigned a surveillance detail. And this time, the team is hell-bent on catching him in the act. It wasn't 24-7 on him, so it was intermittent as we were looking for things uh, to try and put more together on him. Meanwhile, desperate for more hard evidence, a search team continues to follow the robber's coded maps and soon discovers several additional bunkers with more weapons, documents, and gear. This is one of the largest sites that we found. I think we got in a neighborhood of 25 five-gallon buckets out of here. Agents still have no idea why Gagasian is stashing such large quantities of firearms and supplies in the woods. But all the searching eventually pays off when one of the bunkers yields fingerprint evidence. They're an exact match for Carl Gagasian. We linked him to the bunkers and we believed he was linked to the banks as well. There wasn't a smoking gun or, or any direct physical evidence against him in reference to the banks, but there was a lot of circumstantial evidence against him. So we were pretty much working on putting that together. In the meantime, Surveillance teams keep a close eye on their prime suspect. He worked out a lot. He went to the Philadelphia Free Public Library. He would do some banking. Didn't do anything out of the ordinary. Just a regular guy. Fearful that they don't have enough evidence to convict, agents are eager to catch Gagasian in the act of robbing a bank. But suddenly, the investigation comes to a screeching halt. 9-11 occurred and as a result everything in the FBI stopped and our energies and focus was directed towards uh, terrorism. Bank robberies were not as important. Carl Gugasian in the case took a back seat. In the aftermath of 9-11, the FBI's focus on counterterrorism puts the Carl Gugasian investigation on the back burner. But he won't be forgotten for long. On January 25th, 2002, another bank gets hit. 
This time up in Yardley, Pennsylvania. Same way. Same M.O. Then, a couple of weeks later, a second robbery takes place just outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The guy went in just prior to closing, vaulted the teller counter, was wearing a Halloween-type mask with a gun in his hand, baggy clothing, same height and weight as Gugasian. After a three-year hiatus, the Friday night bank robber seems to be back in business. And the more active he is, the greater the chance of someone getting hurt again or even killed. And we felt as though we could not jeopardize the employees of those banks. We could not jeopardize the uh, civilians in that area, the law enforcement officers in that area. If we had him identified, we needed to arrest him. The arrest was initially going to take place at his residence, at his apartment. But we were very concerned because we knew Carl had military experience, had special forces training. We knew that he had a propensity and he was very familiar with weapons. So we were concerned about the safety of the agents doing the arrest. So we waited for the opportune time to do that. And our SWAT officers arrested him outside the Philadelphia Free Public Library. He went to check out a book and instead he got checked out. You're not so scary anymore. Now that you don't have the mask on and you don't have the gun in your hand, you're really just kind of a sad, older guy. But prosecutors soon learn they are facing a myriad of hurdles. Because of a five-year statute of limitations on robberies, the federal government can only charge Gagasian for up to six of the 20-plus heists they believe he committed. And with little in the way of hard evidence, there's no guarantee America's most formidable bank robber won't walk free. We had a completely circumstantial case, but the way that we tied it together inferentially was through linking numerous bank robberies and linking those bank robberies to information that was found in the bunker, uh, which in fact was linked to Carl Gugasian. In a last-ditch attempt for a direct link, investigators reach out to the dozens of bank tellers who saw the Friday night bank robber in action over the years. They had us go down to take a look at the masks, the guns, to look at what they had been able to recover at that point to see if we recognized any of it. And at that point, it was probably six years after it had taken place. After time, things get a little bit fuzzy. Many of them said, yes, that looks like the mask. And if the tellers can identify the mask, and that's going to help you a lot. That's going to go a long way. On February 12, 2002, Gagasian pleads not guilty. But one week before the trial is scheduled to kick off, the defendant surprises everyone. I was approached by his attorney, who said that uh, he wanted to speak with me, and that I was probably going to get one shot to talk to him. Carl was very fascinating. When you think of a bank robber, you think of someone that's very violent in nature. When you meet him, as soon as you sit down and talk to him, you're going to be turned off and there's going to be a barrier. Well, I sat down with Carl, and I was almost immediately, immediately disarmed. It's a sharp contrast to the physical and verbal abuse with which he terrorized his victims. He preferred to do hostile takeover robberies of the banks because he actually didn't get along very well with people. He was a shy person. So his thought was that if he gained control of the people in the bank, uh, that there would be less opportunity or less confrontation with the people in the bank at the time. And he could get in and out with the least amount of confrontation that he could. Not only does Gagasian admit to being the Friday night bank robber, he tells investigators exactly how and why it all began. During one of Carl Gagasian's first robbery attempts at age 15, he got caught in the act. When he got out of Camp Hill, he went back to high school, and one of the things that the counselor told him was, this is going to hurt you, and you'll probably never be able to get a job. So. Despite a stellar academic record, Gagasian ultimately decides the military is his only option. 
that he put in for a certain position that needed top secret clearance. When he didn't get that position, he thought it was his background that prevented him from getting that position. So he decided, you know, I'm never going to be able to get a job. So I got to find some way to make money. And he read an article in the paper about a guy that robbed a bank. And the guy got $80,000. He thought, I can do this. And that's when he decided to uh, enter his career in bank robbery. That was his job. So he had been robbing banks for 16 years before we even knew he was robbing banks. Gagazian then reveals how he was able to get in and out of so many banks without anyone ever noticing him. He had this van, box van. In the back of the box van, there was a motorcycle or off-road dirt bike. And he would drive that van to within eight or 10 miles of the target bank. He would then jump on this off-road dirt bike, ride it down the road and then through the woods till he was anywhere from three to four miles from the bank. Then he would hike through the woods to the surface of the bank, which was usually backed up to a wooded area. He would rob the bank, exit the bank, and go back into the woods. He would stash the money and his uh, equipment in an area and uh, jump on his dirt bike, go back to his van, and then leave. And he'd come back a couple days later and pick up the money and his, uh, his gun and his uh, clothing. During his interview with the FBI, Carl Gagazian admits to robbing more than 50 banks. But on February 10th, 2003, he pleads guilty to just three of the robberies. I personally was surprised when he said he's going to plead to the, the charges. I felt he was an intelligent individual. I didn't think he would you know, give up that easily. In exchange for a 17 and a half year prison term, Gagazian agrees to share all of his secrets with the FBI. He provided a, a training tape. He talks about his life robbing banks, some of the things that banks can do to protect themselves against the typical bank robber. And we use this to, uh, to go out and, and provide training to local, federal, and state law enforcement agencies uh, throughout the country. But several mysteries remain. Why the elaborate bunker system? Why the arsenal of weaponry? And what did he do with all that money? A lot of these things uh, that were in the bunkers tied him to these bank robberies. He did not want these things to be in his home. He figured if it's not here, then they can't charge me with it. If it's somewhere else, it could be anybody's. Over the 30-year period, Carl probably amassed more than $2 million from the theft of these banks. He was a gambler, and uh, he spent all of his time, it seems to me, either gambling, preparing to gamble, recovering from gambling, uh, or preparing to rob banks. Carl said, you know, I looked at bank robbery as a victimless crime. Why should they be concerned about it? I'm not taking their money. It belongs to the bank. And I said, Carl, you got to go through those people to get that money. And what you did to do that uh, terrified those people. When he starts pointing that gun and, and starts yelling and screaming at you, what, what he takes from you is your sense of security. He took something from me. That does make me angry that he just thought that he could just come in and take this money and, you know, nobody would be affected by it. But despite all his brazen acts, Carl Gagazian would have likely remained a ghost forever had it not been for a random discovery in the Radnor Woods. He was someone who arguably could have been successful in many other types of endeavors, but in fact elected to become a, an infamous bank robber, perhaps the most successful bank robber that <laughs>